We're in the middle of a transformational moment in this industry. You have to be loud. You have to be different. The audiences are demanding it. When you can let other perspectives come in, it only helps to bolster the project. We have to be the storytellers of our own stories. Be confident and embrace your vision. Hi, everyone. I'm Princess Sarah Culberson, and on behalf of the STARS Network, I would like to welcome you to this month's Transparency Talk to commemorate Women's History Month and International Women's Day. I am so pleased to moderate what will surely be a fantastic discussion on the topic of exploring global progress toward gender equality and the importance of international content in telling stories about women. I would now like to welcome our panelists, who are all successful and dynamic women making a tremendous difference in their respective fields. Oscar winner and actor, and United Nations and Goodwill Ambassador Mira Sorvino. Executive Director of Women and Girls Initiative of LA County, Abby Land, founder and executive director of Women's March Foundation, Emiliana Guareca, vice president of Girls and Women's Strategy, UN Foundation, Michelle Milford Morris, and president of International Network of Stars, Saperna Kale. <laughs> so I'm excited that we're all here together. And um, I'd like to begin our conversation by focusing on International Women's Day, celebrating every year on March 8th to recognize the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women and the work that needs to be done to achieve women's equality around the world. So in your work, so I'm actually gonna ask this to everyone, but Michelle, I'm actually gonna start with you. So in your work, what are the most pressing issues facing women in this current political, social, and cultural moment? Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Greetings from Austin, Texas. I wish I were with you. And International Women's Day is my favorite day of the year. So thank you for starting there. Um, right now is a really urgent moment for global gender equality. I think there is a gap between what we see and what is actually happening that makes this moment particularly urgent. And what I mean by that is that sometimes the optics are pretty reassuring. Um, you know, we have a woman vice president of the United States. We have women running countries, running companies, running up and down a soccer pitch and then winning equal pay finally. And that stuff is really reassuring. But the truth is the data is clear and it is compelling. Progress towards gender equality has been slow, fragile, incremental, and reversible, which makes conversations like this so important, makes the work of the UN essential. It's, it's a privilege that I get to do that. Um, but International Women's Day has been around for more than 100 years, and the earliest protests were about equal pay and the unpaid care burden and economic opportunity. More than 100 years later, women all over the world are saying, we need equal pay, we need more economic opportunities, we need to share the unpaid care burden, we also need to do something about violence against women. So too little has changed over the past hundred years, but I tend to be an optimist because maybe a place where this conversation can start is, is this. Number one, inequality is a choice. It's just a choice. Uh, we can choose something different. And the other thing is that this is a solvable problem. We don't need to leap in science or technology. We need more political will and more solidarity. But we don't need any magic here. We can, can choose something different. And so maybe that's a place of hope that we can start from today. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, my next question is actually for Emiliana. So I wanted to ask you, uh, you're an executive director of the Women's March Foundation. And since its inception, the organization has rallied. I mean, it's pretty incredible what you all have done. Has rallied hundreds and thousands of people across the nation to raise their voices on the behalf of women's rights. So. How has your mission expanded and since the very first March? I'm looking at how does it expand since the very first March and what are the priority 
the priorities and the main issues now? Wow, we've expanded where we have mobilized women to the polls. Women, women are responsible for VP Kamala Harris. Let's let's face it. Um, Women's March has been incredibly supported by women across the country, across the world. And what we are currently working on really is on our feminist street initiative, which is the uh, visibility of women um, on the streets, from us taking the streets to, in protest to actually being um, memorialized in history in street names. Mm. We are also working on voter rights with our Defend Democracy initiative. Um, we have contacted over 10 million women and have, <laughs> yes, just, yes, that's a lot of women. To that's mobilize incredible. them to the polls because we know that women, a woman's economic agenda is necessary. But unless we mobilize the women to the polls and women into political office and into CEO positions, it's not going to happen. So that is how we've changed. I honestly thought that we were going to march and then go back to our lives. That's not possible because there's so much more work to be done. And so our mission has changed in terms of really mobilizing women to the polls. Instead of just taking the streets, we're going to get streets named after our historical women. I saw that. That is so exciting. <laughs> there, is there a certain, any certain woman that you, you're ready for her name to be oh, out there? Oh, certain women. Let's I know. do this. So we have uh, applied for Dolores Huerta in Los Angeles. So we've Wonderful. applied for Bell Hooks, for Gloria Steinem, for Maya Angelou. Um, and Wilma Mankiller in Oklahoma. So we are looking at women have always been powerful, but we've been invisibilized. So the street initiative is something that will put us back on the map across the country, across the world, if we wanted to. I love it. Thank you for sharing. I have another uh, question. So the Women's March Foundation has been extremely effective on building coalitions, right? Uh, local, national, and international. I mean, the mobilization has been incredible. What have been the most effective strategies in building and sustaining the coalition? MD. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's only about, talk funding, about right? economic agendas. We are talking about women's organizations fighting for that same dollar, fighting for that same equal pay. Yes. And so when we look at it and when we talk about um, women's empowerment, people say, don't empower me, pay me. And that is the same thing we are dealing with coalition building. We work across different coalitions and we work with our, um, really our strengths, right? And we may not all agree on how we get a place, but we can agree that women have impact. And so that working together will get us really into equity. And the infighting and all of that that happens and during coalition building, is forgotten when we get to equity. Keep in mind, we still are not equal. No matter what color, race, socioeconomic level you come from, we're not equal. The Equal Rights Amendment has failed to pass for 80 years. We're not there yet. So coalition building is critical in order for women to get to equity. And the importance of women coming together to really make that happen, the, the sisterhood, the camaraderie, which is, which is key in that. Um, so my other, my next question, thank you so much, is um, for Mira. So Mira, your activism is as impressive as your film career. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's very inspiring. Um, so you were a spokesperson for, you were a spokesperson for Amnesty International's Stop Violence Against Women campaign. And you're presently a goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Really inspiring. So can you tell us how you became engaged in advocacy work? And can you also speak to the intersection between art? We were kind of talking about this a little bit, art and activism. OK, uh, thank you so much. Um, I. Well, always, always, always in my life, I was always very motivated by uh, inequality, prejudice, genocide, uh, racism, sexism, any ism. And when I got to Harvard, although I was a Chinese studies major, I ended up writing my thesis about racial conflict in China. So it was really sort of like an anthro sociology thesis about why racial conflict occurs both 
generically and in a, in a site-specific place, culturally specific place. And um, because I wanted to learn more about racism and prejudice, and it was a very fascinating journey for me. And then after I got out of school, I worked on something called Street Side Stories, which tried to get kids across the country motivated to write and read rather than engage with, at that point, video games and television. We didn't have phones mm -hmm. yet. Um, and then I worked in a documentary in the former Soviet Union called Freedom to Hate, which was about um, the rise of hate groups and hate speech because of Glasnost and Perestroika, which is topical again, really. Um, but, uh, and then I became an actress. And then for about 10 years, I think it was hard for me to put all the activism stuff in play because I was working so hard to get my career off the ground. But when I was pregnant with my first child, um, actually, Bonnie Abounza, who is part of this <laughs> event today, um, invited me to be part of an evening that Amnesty International was hosting about the disappeared women of Juarez and Chihuahua, Mexico, and to host that mm -hmm. evening and give a speech. And afterwards, they were like, well, we loved what you did. Would you like to be our Stop Violence Against Women campaign spokesperson? And I was like, yes, yes, yes. I've been looking for some way to get back into doing what I love. And especially because I knew I was going to have a little girl child, you know, I needed to help be a part of uh, solution making in this world that she was going to come of age in. And um, she's 17 now, and mm. she is the fiercest feminist and, and social justice warrior and created a social justice club at her high school called Arts for Justice Collective. And so she's just like a dream come true in terms of like the next generation that cares and that is active. Um, but while I was doing the, um, the Stop Violence Against uh, Women campaign with Amnesty, uh, human trafficking came to my attention and I was not aware that slavery was still alive and well in our world. And when in fact, there are more people enslaved today than at any other point in recorded human history. Over 30 million people are living in conditions of modern slavery. And that was so stunning to me and so angering. And I started putting a lot of attention into that and I did a lifetime mini series about it that actually was very fetid. It got like Emmy nods and Golden Globe nods and, uh, and it was a really serious piece. And I vetted it with Amnesty. I said, is this, is this accurate? Is it respectful? Is it you know, really doing the right thing? I don't want to do anything exploitative. And they read it and they were like, actually, yeah, they really got it right. So that was the first time that I combined my love of activism with an artistic project. Um, in 2009, the UN became aware of my activism and they asked me to join them on the anti-human trafficking front and I've been doing it since then and it has been one of the great honors and privileges of my life. But, you know, as an actor, we have a sort of, I guess, a bully pulpit because of, we have a natural fame. Um, I'm not the most famous of actresses, certainly people like Angelina Jolie have a lot more reach, but um, I've tried around the world to interview victims of human trafficking and bring all of that knowledge into any of my, um, my outreach. And more and more, we're trying to push the power to survivors. So survivor leaders are always at the table on any event concerning human trafficking. But my knowledge has been increased like a hundredfold by all of these interviews that I've done of these victims who are largely, you know, over 70% women and girls across the world. The victims of human trafficking are, are that, that percentage female. Um, and it, it, it's really changed my life and I've tried to be of service and then and then I became part of the outcry with Harvey Weinstein because I was one of his victims. And, you know, the Me Too movement was founded and erected by Tarana Burke. And I do not want to take that phrase and make it like a white woman's phrase. Um, we just sort of joined into a chorus that she had already created. Um, and that community of women who broke the silence and stood up to a monster and other monsters who had all of this corporate power and thought they were invincible and they could continue destroying women's lives by sexually harassing or assaulting them. Um, that became a new calling because I, you know, I had kept my own personal s suffering to myself for many years and I'm a rape victim, I'm a sexual assault victim and, as a teenager and I was a sexual assault and harassment victim of Harvey's. And to be public now with it actually is really empowering, although it was very painful for a while. And what I did with my pain is I tried to create legislative change. So I joined forces with equal rights advocates here in California, and we got many bills passed in the California legislature. Um, 
I went to New York and crazily enough, at the behest of Andrew Cuomo, um, got three anti-sexual harassment bills passed there and gave a big speech about how I had been date raped and we extended the, statuation, uh, the, the statute of limitations um, you know, quite extensively on second and third degree rape in New York. We didn't get it fully abolished, but we, we really made it, a dent in it. And I actually spoke about the no grope policy that we had already instituted in California law and brought it to New York. And then crazily enough, the governor has been accused of doing exactly what I described in front of the legislature to uh, someone under you know, his <laughs> umbrella, um, putting his hand under her shirt and groping her. And I literally sat there and from the audience and explained that one grope is one too many and that there's no tolerance because there used to be a sort of a severe pervasive standard in New York and California to what was enough to be deemed like worthy of action that, that it fell under the sexual harassment um, uh, rubric, not the criminal standing, but the, the civil one. And then after that speech, Cuomo allegedly did that. So for me, it was such a crazy betrayal because this was an ally and I have not spoken about this before. I've written something for myself, but it was a crazy betrayal that like a man who purported to be our ally in, in this fight actually himself was ongoingly committing infractions in this arena. Now, granted, this is all alleged, and I do not want to, you know, I, I can't know. Right. But, but we have to, you know, support people who come out. And, um, but we still get the law passed. Yeah. So despite mixed intentions on the people who were promulgating it, we got those advances, um, you know, and then there was a look back for child survivors. Now there's a, a, a law, you know, that we're trying to do a look back for all victims of sexual violence in the state of, of New York. So these things of, you know, we, we, we move in fits and starts and, and we, have, we have setbacks and we have, you know, sort of false allies, as I said, um, but together we can't lose. It's just a question of time of how far we can get in how much time. And I we do- I think that's a huge thing that you're saying, together we can't lose. Right. I think that's such a powerful statement. It's a community. It is a community, and it's about all of us and working together. And it's intersectional, together. and it's and it's not. You know, we are anyone who identifies as female. They don't even have to be born, you know, biologically female. Anyone who identifies with female is in this with us. Right. In this fight with us, non-binary people are in this fight with us. Um, the inequity and the mistreatment that we all risk every day in every single culture. You know, people think America, United States is so advanced. So much domestic violence, rape, assault happens here. So right. much pay inequity, so much keeping down, you know. Um, so, you know, we are all in this together and only together will we finally make those big advances. And I've, I've been to the women's marches uh, before I was ever asked to speak at one of them. I spoke at one of them. It was really thrilling and terrifying. And, <laughs> you know, so, so every little bit of this solidarity, this sisterhood helps. It, and it makes a huge difference. It's so important. I have another question for you. Um, uh, so Hollywood is often um, the forefront of the social issues and, and different conversations causing to highlight them, educating audiences, um, mobilizing people to act. So do you feel like um, that the narratives we're seeing in movies and in documentaries and series today are addressing stories about women's equality globally? Well, I think they are. I think they are more and more. I think that having, you know, female leads and female leads from very diverse backgrounds um, is is part of it, and I think that Stars is very good at putting women front and center in their storylines. I happen happen to be in you know our our new Stars show, Shining Veil, vale, which is helmed by Courtney Cox as the female lead. I have a wonderful role, Judith Flight, Gus Burney. We have all female directors. We had a very 50-50 crew. Um, it, it, we have an almost completely female writer room, except for Jeff Astroff, who's an honorary woman. <laughs> He's so sympathetic <laughs> to us. have a man in there He's as well. fantastic and the biggest champion of women and so brilliant, so I have to give him credit. But, um, you know, 
I don't know. I, I, you know, the, the answer is I don't know. Yeah. The answer is I think we're getting closer. You know, I remember when I was a younger actress and there would be a movie and it would be a bigger movie and I'd be offered a part in it and they'd say, we don't have the budget to pay you your quote. You're just gonna get this like, you know, 5% of what you usually get because we've spent all the money and all the men's salaries. So you'd have men getting multi, multi millions of dollars and it was supposed to be like an honor that I was cast in it. And there was one female lead to seven male lead roles. And, and that is something I'm seeing changing. Yes. Like that is really changing, you know, but that the cast even, but like think about that. Like, you know, X is getting 10 million, this one's getting 5 million. You're gonna get 5% of your usual salary, but you're lucky to be in this movie because it's a movie with big actors and, and you're, there you are. And, um, but you feel like you've seen, you're seeing that I'm change I'm seeing that a change, lot. yeah. I am yeah. seeing that change and I'm seeing stories that are like, uh, I don't know, like Little America is, is like a fascinating anthology of, of international experiences lived in America, transplants to America. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot out there, but there could be, there there, could be more. And yeah. I think there could be more content of international stories on American. Like, I, I feel like we still have a very North America-centric focus in our content. To have a more global reach and understand yes. what's happening. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I loved watching, you know, um, Drive My Car this year is one of the Oscar nominated films, which is very much about uh, an Asian perspective. You know, there's Japanese characters, there's Chinese, there's Korean characters in it. And it was completely relatable and moving and it didn't take place in English or here or, you know, it was a very powerful film. So I think the more that we have, and, and like, I love the Writing With Fire documentary about the Indian women journalists, that's incredible. And they're all from the untouchable cast. Like, it's sort of mind blowing how powerful those women are and what they've been able to achieve and how they've been able to show that nothing holds them back and that they actually make change within their country. Like, so more of those stories that become more widely promulgated across our media, I think is, is just the better for everyone. And that's, I think, part of the through line of connecting all of us, knowing more what's happening globally and with women globally too. Thank you so much. So Saperna, yes. you're next. <laughs> So I, I want to actually ask you the same question. And I want to ask, as you lead international expansion of STARS through STARS Play Service, and do you feel that STARS shows are amplifying women's stories globally? And what is your res what has the response been both domestically and internationally from global audiences? So for us, the way we look at uh, everything we do in the DNA of STARS and STARS Play internationally is, is really making sure that we're, t we're telling stories that are authentic. And so they can only really come from the people that have lived or, or really understand the story. So whether that's women telling stories or other minority groups telling the stories and writing the stories and being the showrunners and being you know, the person responsible for casting and, and uh, directing and producing and, and all of it really, that's very, very authentic to what we do. And so for us, you know, looking at a show like we have in, um, in coming out of Mexico called Senorita 89, which is helmed by uh, a woman named Lucia who has put together this amazing, amazing show that's actually tells the story of the salacious world of, of pageants, but it's done in such an authentic way that it's actually 100% on Rotten Tomatoes right now, which is phenomenal for us. So that's a show that it's coming out of Mexico that we're, we're airing all over, including in the U.S. Uh, through a sister company and then in Spain and other territories as well. And so for us, anything that we do, wherever it might be, as long as it's an authentic story coming from the people that are ultimately responsible for the idea, I think it's critical. So, you know, um, writing with fire, for example, telling the story of the Dalits from the perspective of the Dalits, is, I'm so amazed that you mentioned that because it is Isn't it fantastic. It's fantastic. It's it's an untouchable world where these these women have often can't read, often have no rights or very limited rights, and look what they've done. It, it's amazing to me. Um, I can talk to you for hours, honestly. <laughs> um, and so you know, for us, uh, everything we do at Stars, whether it's you know, people at hiring people like me, you know, I'm uh, Indian American. I've lived in a few countries. Um, worked my way up through the Hollywood system, again, on the, I can't write, act or dance or do anything, so I'm on the business side. Um, but it's, you know, let, Hollywood is culture, right? It's what we export. And so that culture, you have to make sure, is telling stories 
that that are res that resonate. And so you know, silly things like having characters that are gay that are just not in any kind of stereotypical way that are just normal people like everybody else is a normal person just portrayed in that way I think has done a lot for the LGBTQ world um, having Indian characters that are not stereotypical with ac accents also same thing or any culture really people are people and I think that Hollywood has a really important role to play in that and to ensure that what we say and what we do traverses boundaries traverses borders and and really brings the best to bear Mm -hmm. of who we are. I totally echo that and agree. So years ago, a woman director said the following. Um, the women executives in the film industry have the power to say no, but few of them have the power to say yes, <laughs> right? So stars made a commitment to hire more women across the board, which has been quite phenomenal and exciting, from the C-suite to writing rooms in and in front of and behind the camera. So as president of the international networks, you are a woman executive that can say yes, right? Which yes. is awesome. Can you discuss how the network's commitment has resulted in successful global programming and authentic storytelling? So amazingly enough, I have been doing this a long time, uh, I have never worked with so many women before uh, as colleagues, which is amazing. And so from programming to marketing to, to what I do on the international side, um, you know, we have women that are just super strong. So 75% of our workforce is our C-suite women are, are women, um, half of whom are women of color. And when does that ever happen? When does that ever happen? That's it incredible. It just doesn't. And it's, it's really a, a testament to, to what we believe as a company, which is what's on air should reflect, you know, the population, frankly, and, and to serve underserved audiences and women, you need to have those folks in making decisions on programming. And so we walk that walk. And so that's in the US. Well, what about international, which is where my whole job you know, is? Because um, my job is to bring stars into every home outside the United States. And so I was actually kind of wondering if people outside the US actually care about these things. And so we commissioned a study, and it turns out that 59% of folks um, want diverse folks behind the camera. And 52% want women specifically. And so we really take that to heart and we aren't kind of making that up. We, we really believe in, in women and in uh, underrepresented groups behind the camera. And so that is what you see on our programming across the board, whether it's a show like Senorita 89, like I just described, or whether it's a show called Nacho, which is by women producers, happens to be about the porn industry set in Spain, but Again, a woman behind the scenes. Um, and so we, we, we are very, very, very committed to what we have on air. Yeah, it, it's clear with the numbers and so on and people, the representation is really powerful. It's, I, I really feel like it's education and representation, which is so important. So um, the UN urges international community to imagine a gender equal world, right? While we have seen such progress since the United nation's decade for women from the period of 1975 to 1985 that focused on the policies and issues that impact women, such as equal pay, um, gendered violence, land holding, and other human rights, we still have, unfortunately, a long way to go to achieve a women's equality. So Michelle, this question is for you. So. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to the work of the UN Women and the UN Foundation? And what are you all doing in addressing some of the most pressing needs of women worldwide and its efforts to accelerate progress towards global equality? It is a privilege to work with the United Nations and the UN every day. I think you're right. I'm pleased that the panelists here are pointing out that Gender equality is a universal challenge. It's the same here in the United States. It's not a problem for other people. It is our problem uh, right now. And that it, the, the gaps in equality are steeper um, for black women, women of color and trans women, migrant women, young women, um, disabled women. I think it's really important that we understand that um, the experience is not the same for all of our sisters uh, all over the world. You and women is focused on that every single day and on closing some of these gaps. And the panel has already pointed out where some of the biggest problems are. 
One of them is the pay gap, which is, has remained stubborn uh, for decades. Another one of them is economic opportunity. There are laws in countries all over the world in which women can't hold the same jobs, they can't inherit the land that they work, um, they can't leave their houses, they can't apply for passports, they can't pass on citizenship to their children. I think there's like 2.4 billion women around the world who don't have the same legal rights as, as men and boys. The U UN Women's working on that, the World Bank is working on that, the UN as a whole is working on that. There's also maternal mortality, which continues to be a big problem Still in the United States, in fact, but all over the world, women die giving birth, uh, which is a stain on our conscience and absolutely indefensible and completely unnecessary. But that's another area that we're all working on. UNFPA, a big part of the UN, is doing incredible work there. Um, so there's just a lot of areas from laws to economic agency to ending violence against women. The Spotlight Initiative, which is uh, Liz with the Executive Office of the Secretary General at the UN, Spotlight Initiative is focused on doing something about that, which um, Mira has mentioned already. One in three women globally experience violence. We've got to do something about that. That is a horrendous problem that undermines all of our hopes for equality uh, for all women. We organize at the UN Foundation all of this work under the banner of Equal Everywhere. We think equality is her birthright, and we think we should do everything we can, and we shouldn't stop until we achieve equality. And I think it's not said enough, because we're talking here about the experience of girls and women, but it is also true, gender inequality is bad for men and boys. It's bad for them too. They live with rigid social norms that hem in their potential and how they want to live their lives. But there's some hope there as well, because that means we can bring them in as allies. I often think gender equality is not like this challenge in which it's like girls and women against men and boys. It's fair-minded people against fear-minded people. Fair-minded people want something better. They want something better for all of us. Fair-minded people want things to stay the same way, and they want to hold on to rigid structures of power. So every day I wake up and I work with and for the UN on all of these things, um, and it's just it's it's a privilege, but it's also really urgent urgent work right now. So I can't tell you what a joy it is to hear my fellow panelists uh, talk about the ways in which they are also pushing for progress and equality everywhere every day. Yeah. You know, thank you for sharing all of that and thank you for all the work that you're doing in this area. And, and, and I have a question about outside of governments and what can business and civil society and the public do to help societies advance women's equality? And what role, well, let me just stop there. And maybe what role can the, can the artists in the entertainment industry and executives play in supporting the UN? I know that's a big question. But we want to know how we can be of support of, uh, with all of us. It takes a village, right? So, yes. yes. No, it does. And I'm particularly happy to hear you ask about business. Because business has a giant role to play here. I mean, let's face it. Private sec the private sector is the source of our incomes, our benefits. They have enormous influence in communities. They control advertising. They control supply chains. And some of them have profits that are bigger than the GDP of small countries. So we cannot do this without private sector leadership. And the encouraging thing is that private sector leaders are showing, in a lot of ways, more ambition than, in fact, a lot of government leaders right now. And that is really welcome. And they're doing that because, by the way, they benefit from it. Companies that, that create workplaces that work for women, they are going to win the wars for talent. They're going to have more revenue. They're going to have less turnover. They're going to win bigger market share. That is all demonstrably true. So it is smart. But any private sector leader listening to me right now, I want to tell you to do five very specific things. We call this at the UN Foundation five for five. Five things for SDG five. That's the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal devoted to gender equality. The first is that you have to pay women and men equally for equal work, no exceptions. The second is look across your company. Are there equal women in all levels of the company, in the IT department, on the board, at the executive level, in middle management? You have to have women's representation at all levels. The third thing is, do you have paid sick and family leave? And are you encouraging men to take it? That is critical. Um, the fourth thing is you have to have safe workplaces and you have to have consistent and transparent policies to address those workplaces. And then the fifth thing is one that I think uh, the community in Hollywood and beyond has a particular influence over, and that is that you've got to stop diminishment 
and stereotypes in your advertising. Advertising is influential. It influences how we see women and women's roles and their power. And you have to question what you're putting out there with regard to advertising and marketing. You have the power to do something better with that and with regard to that and to end diminishment of girls and women in your advertising. So those are five things that businesses can do. Yeah. And because you asked me about individuals, let me just say here, like this is not a moment for despair for individuals. This is a moment to act. We can see from global headlines what a privilege it is to live in representative democracy. And we know, again, from data, that movements matter. Look, we have a representative from the Women's March here. She's right. Kamala Harris is because of those women and men in the streets. Movements matter. Contacting your legislators, your parliamentarians, your mayors, your government, your governors, that stuff matters. It actually is what changes how we do things. So if you don't like how your government is treating the issue of equality, we can say so. We can demand something better, and we should. Great. Thank you so much. All of those are such wonderful pieces of information and guides. And I hear what you're saying, because when we think about all people standing up and working together, having are these women represented in all these different places? And are there... Are there different ethnicities and racial diversity right inside of all of that as well and religious and socioeconomic, which actually has people come together and think about things and act differently because we have so many diverse voices at the table. So thank you so much for sharing that. So my next question is for you, Abby. <laughs> um, so you have served multiple terms as mayor of West Hollywood advancing progressive public policies, and now as the executive director of Women and Girls Initiative, you focus on improving the lives of women's rights throughout LA County. So thank you for doing that. Um, can you speak about the issues and challenges they face and how the county is addressing them? Sure. Um well, thank you so much. It's so great to be here. And I've just enjoyed so much listening to everybody. And the challenges that women and girls are facing in Los Angeles County are unfortunately very similar to the challenges that you've heard from everybody else. Uh, you know, women and girls, especially now through this uh, COVID pandemic, it has really shown people the inequities that women and girls are facing. And, uh, you know, we've seen women having to leave the workforce. We've seen women having to go to work because they're essential workers and putting their lives and their families' lives on the line. We've seen people losing money and facing eviction. Um, so the, the issues are a lot, but we are really lucky. We are in Los Angeles County. We have a board of supervisors. There are five women, five incredible women, and really looking at how can government solve some of these things. Uh, so there are many initiatives that we've been able to advance to really address uh, some of these horrible inequities. And one of the most important things is, of course, talking about it so that people really get to understand that they're real, that uh, women and girls are suffering. You know, more women are homeless uh, because of domestic violence here in Los Angeles County. And, you know, we need to uh, do more on that. Our Board of Supervisors have put in uh, evic eviction protections. Um, and, you know, one of the new things that our board is doing, which is really great, and this is something that's happening across the country, is to have a guaranteed income program for low-income folks. And people have shown, when people get a steady amount a small, steady amount, it makes a huge difference. And in LA County, where 30% of the women who are um, heads of single households live in poverty, something like that can be life-changing for them. So government really has an incredible role in looking at how to address these issues, as well as how to ensure that they're developing some best practices to share with other folks because that's, that's really important. And, you know, I, uh, one of the panelists, you were talking about the private sector and how they need to 
make sure that uh, there is equality. And here in LA County, we're just rolling out a new tool, a gender impact assessment tool to look internally at our um, 37 departments who provide services so they can make sure that their workforce is diverse, uh, that they can make sure their leadership is diverse and accountable, and that they can make sure that their programs are really looking to um, have equality and making significant impact in the lives of the people we're serving. And when we do a gender impact assessment, we are the Women and Girls Initiative. We care about women and girls. But the truth is we need to understand all the potential um, inequities out there. So we level it. And I always say, if we make it better for women and girls, we have actually made it better for everybody. And I know our Board of Supervisors embraces that as well. Yes. I, I was thinking about the former Secretary General Kofi Annan, who talked about when you support a girl and a woman, you support a whole community and a nation. So I, I, I hear you on that. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the intersection between economic rights and women's rights. What are the economic ramifications of not advancing the rights of women and girls in the county, especially in relation to housing employment and safety? And what is the role of local government in addressing this issue? You spoke a bit about that, but I just wanted to see if there's anything else you'd like to share. Sure. Well, you know, in LA County, um, we have 10 million people and over half of them are women and girls. So if we are not advancing their economic rights, this county is going to go to heck in a handbasket. <laughs> you know, it, right. it is really critical that, that we are doing that. Uh, and you know, there are certain things that government can do. First, again, looking at pay equity. You know, um, I think government might actually do a better job in pay equity than maybe in the private sector, because so much of what we do is visible and transparent. You can go on a website and look up everyone's salary in the county of Los Angeles. But um, that's really critical. But making sure that women have the support they need to advance, making sure that girls are going to have the support they need to advance. So what can the county do? A, the county makes sure that uh, their schools and their parks are giving girls opportunities for STEAM activities, you know, science, technology, engineer, arts, um, math. Those are key programs uh, to move forward in the world, making sure that those things are available. The county also has the ability to look at how to build more affordable housing, look at what housing models might actually support women better than uh, the current housing models that we have. You know, this intersection between economic um, justice and um, equality is, is critical. We also need to look at so many women left the workforce because they had to take care of their families. You know, with all of our advancement, women are still the major caregivers in this country, um, probably all over the world. And um, in Los Angeles, you know, during COVID, we lost many child care providers, um, couldn't afford to stay open anymore. So looking, the county is looking to see what it can be doing to help uh, bring some of those businesses back and most of those businesses are women-owned businesses. Uh, they're looking to see what else they can do to improve, um, improve it so the people who work in the child care industry and the caregiving industry actually earn decent wages and um, decent benefits because many of them don't yet. And so the government has a, a big role to play, you know, at the local level, as well as ensuring um, advocacy at the statewide level to do that. But again, as I said, it's, you have to invest in women. Women before the pandemic uh, the, uh, were opening more small businesses than any other group across this country. Uh, women really are economic drivers. And you know, they're that way because they're resilient, they're creative, and let's face it, for most women, you are balancing. You're balancing your career, you're balancing your family, you're balancing your checkbook, you're balancing a thousand different things. These are successful people. We need to make sure we give them every opportunity to, su to succeed. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love it. So I would like to end this wonderful conversation with one final question. Emiliana. <laughs> I read a quote from you where you said 
that women need to identify our power and step into it. So what was the impetus for making that statement? And I want to ask all of you to also comment on this idea of stepping into your power in your own perspective um, roles and jobs. Right. I, I think for me, I'm, you know, I'm this Latina woman. I'm like the seventh of 13 kids. Wow. And really knowing that I was always powerful from this age. Now I need to step into it and be comfortable with it. And so I think that for me is for everyone, every woman, step into it. You know what your power is. If you close your eyes. Ah, I, I see it. You know, when I close my eyes, I'm like, I'm I ready. Think about it. So <laughs> you know that you're powerful, knowing that and stepping into it and being okay with the spotlight, being okay with being powerful is enough. I, I just recently sent flowers to my mom for March 8th for International Women's Day. And she, she calls me and she says, I am a woman, not just a mother, not just a caregiver. I'm a woman. Right? And I'm going to step into my power. So I, I, for me, it's really critical that women really know that we have always been powerful and that it's time. That it's time for us to step into it, highlight it, and let's do it. You have a whole community around that we will support you. You will be supported. Right? And I don't think I've ever, I, I didn't grow up thinking that. I didn't grow up thinking that I had power. Right? But we do. Who's running our household? Women. Who's running the world? Women. <laughs> Step into your power. We're ready for you. I mm -hmm. love it. Thank you so much. Do you want to share anything about that statement? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> That's a hard one. Step into your power. Um, inside of like your career, inside of your, your role and things that you see in life. So I used to be an activist when I was younger. And um, then I went into the business world. Um, and I think. For me personally, I think it's a, I want to be able to meld the two. Yeah. So when I was younger, I worked for the Campaign for Peace and Democracy, which was the when uh, the Soviet Union was breaking up in the newly independent states and just mm. figuring out the economics of and the political nature of all of that and help holding various forums across the world. Um, I worked on the National yeah. Student Coalition Against Harassment when I was in college uh, with Mayor Garcetti, actually, when we were young kids long ago. Um, and so I think there's a, a world in which I want to find a way to take what I do and, and the incredible supportive environment we have um, at our company alongside some of the activism they used to do back in the day. Wonderful. How about you, Michelle? What do you think? Well, what I think is that when I think about that, I think about how can I share power? Mm -hmm. This whole group that. here, we have, an, we have enormous power and privilege. And so how do you share that power? Gender inequality is stemmed, I think, from hoarding of power among too few and fear of giving other people power. And so when I think about it the other day, I think, how do I share the power that I have? Uh, if there's someone who's not at this table, how do I find a chair and scoot over so they can sit there with me? Um, so I think of stepping into my power every day is how do I share it? How do I seed it? How do I share it? Uh, how do I amplify it? Um, this is a really good group to, to do that. I, I love that. I think that's so powerful. How can we all stand in our power? And if we aren't standing in our power, how can we even share that? So the importance of giving ourselves the permission sometimes to step into our power, because then that gives others permission to step into theirs as well. So, well, I just want to thank all of you. I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. And I want you all to know, if you'd like to find more out about STARS and the amazing work that STARS is doing, you can check out starstakethelead.com. So thank you all for your words, you. your wisdom, and your sisterhood. It's really powerful. Let's step into our power and share it with everyone. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Take care, everyone.